If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We are walking through the book of Romans. Uh, We are going verse by verse, line by line. Uh, Last week I spoke on the subject of justification. And this week I'm going to speak on the subject of justification. You got part one last week, and we're going to give you part two this week. Let me go ahead and give you the outline. Uh, Justification, number one, justification by faith. Justification by faith. If you have a bulletin and want to write in there, you can do that. Number two, justification, not circumcision. Uh, The Jews of that day thought circumcision had something to do with salvation, and it does not. And we will uh, point this out in Scripture. And number three, justification by imputation. And uh, we will explain this word here in just a few minutes. You know, last week, the bottom line to this, the whole message was, we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. It's not works. You can't earn your way. You can't pray your way in. Some, somebody can't do it for you. All right, it is justification by faith in Jesus Christ. The entire fourth chapter of Romans is devoted to Abraham, whom Paul uses as an illustration of the Bible truth that man can become right with God only by faith in response to God's grace and never by works. Abraham lived 2,000 years before Paul wrote the book of Romans. He lived 600 years before the law was given to Moses. Paul used Abraham's example as an example of justification by faith because he was the supreme example of Old Testament salvation when the Lord accepted him because of his genuine faith. The Jewish leaders taught that man was made right with God by obeying the law, by having religious activities, or by their works. If man gets the issue of salvation wrong, it will affect him for all of eternity. This is why Paul is making sure everyone reading understands the doctrine of salvation, uh, justification, and imputation. Let's look at this extremely important issue in the fourth chapter of Romans. Romans Romans 4, verse 1, justification by faith. What then shall we say that Abraham our father, for, uh, uh, for if Abraham was justified by works, He has done something to boast about, but not before God. And he starts out saying, and folks, you have to realize, all right, Paul was a Jew. He knew uh, what the Jewish leaders were thinking. And he knew, and he's going to do it again in this text. He did it four times last chapter. And he's going to take Old Testament Scripture and use it uh, to let these Jewish leaders know that it is justification by faith in Jesus Christ. So look at the first verse. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? And you have to understand, and you have to go back to Genesis chapter 12. Go with me to Genesis 12. And I want you to see, uh, you know, God calling Abraham. And even after the flood, uh, before this particular scripture, and after the Tower of Babel, uh, you have to realize Abram, he was Abram in this scripture, and later God changes his name to Abraham. But by birth, he was a Gentile. He was a Chaldean by birth. And so you understand, uh, you know, when he chose uh, Abraham or Abram here, he was, he was starting a new thing. Matter of fact, look at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. So we see here, which is an amazing thing in Scripture, God called Abram as the first Jew, the first one of the Jewish nation. And he was not only the first Jew. You know what else he was? He was the first Christian. The first Christian. 
Because you have to understand the way people uh, came to Christ in the Old Testament and in the New Testament are different. And the difference is, folks, it's, it's because of Calvary. See, people that work for salvation, they are working hard at that. And what they understand, or what they don't understand, folks, Jesus Christ does the work. He did the work on the cross. And so we can't, uh, we can't you know, come to Jesus by what we do. And this is what he is saying in this first part. Paul is saying in this first verse in uh, Romans chapter 4. Now look at the, the second verse. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And again, Abraham wasn't a perfect person, okay? You know, he was good, all right? You know, he, he was in some ways, you know, moral and, and, and a, a good person. But he, Paul is pointing out again that we don't, because people think, well, and I've heard this many a times, if my good outweighs my bad, I'm going to heaven. But well, folks, that is not what the Bible says. Your works aren't going to get you there. One is, how do you know when you've done enough? There's always somebody else doing more than you are. There's always somebody else more sincere. So how can we say, and, and Paul is just saying, he did not do it by his works. Folks, we have learned in Romans chapter 3 that, that we have all sinned. We have all come short of the glory of God. And the bar is high, folks. All right, it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through perfection. And you've already blown one of those, all right? You are not perfect and neither am I. So he's saying again to these Jewish leaders, it's not about works. You cannot work your way into heaven. You can't clean up enough. You cannot be good enough to get there. Now look at verse 3. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. For righteousness. And he uses two examples in these first few verses, actually first eight verses. He uses Abraham, and then he will use David as examples of this. Because you have to understand, Abraham lived before the law. Before the law. It hadn't even been given. And David lived after the law. But yet both of them are in Hebrews chapter 11. Why? Because they were heroes of the faith. Heroes of the faith. So Paul, I'm just telling you folks, he was an intelligent man. He knew Scripture forward and backwards. He could debate with anyone. He could prove things with Scripture. All right, He was precise in what he was saying. He was up front and and, and was, was just very good at what he was doing. So uh, here, let's look at Genesis chapter 15. Go back to Genesis, if you would. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing that I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? He had promised him back in chapter 12 he would be the father of many nations, that the Jewish race would start right there, but yet he was getting up in the years, and he was still uh, saying, you know, it just haven't happened yet. Lord, I know you promised me that. I know and I believe what you were saying, but it's getting kind of late in life to have children. And Eliezer uh, was his, his most trusted servant. So if there were not uh, uh, a sons, if there were not someone that would be an heir to that, then it would come to his most trusted servant. Now look at verse 3. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring, and indeed one born in my house is of my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And folks, we know you can't count all the stars. That's impossible. 
It's impossible. And it says, and he said unto him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Folks, I'm telling you, this is uh, Abra, Abram's salvation, who later on went to be Abraham. Because of his faith, because he believed in God's promise. And you think about this, folks. The Old Testament folks had to believe in, in something that had not happened yet. It had not happened. The cross had not happened yet. And that is so, so important in this Scripture. I look back in chapter 4, verse 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. And again, with wages, we know what that's all about. If we work a certain amount of hours and we get paid a certain uh, wage, we know at the end of the day, all right, this is what owes us, or even like a week period or a two-week period. But folks, that's not the way it is with salvation. We cannot work hard enough. We cannot work enough. We cannot, uh, salvation cannot be bought, folks. It is Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus uh, in salvation. Then he goes to David. Look at verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And now he's getting back to the issue of being a Jew or being a Gentile. The Jews of those days did not believe Gentiles could be saved. They thought they were too ungodly, that they were too wicked, and they could not let them be on equal grounds with them. And so he uses David in these verses. Because when we think of David, we know the verse says, uh, verse uh, in the Bible says, David at one time was a man after God's own heart. But yet he blew it, folks. He did terrible things with Bathsheba. He committed adultery. And not only committed adultery, folks, he committed murder. He had Uriah the Hittite killed, one of his soldiers, all right? And that's what he's saying. You know, David broke the law, but David was still saved. And he's just trying to get us to understand that salvation comes to everyone who believeth, it, to the godly and to the ungodly is what he is saying here and it says uh just verse six just as david also uh describes the blessedness to the man to whom god imputes righteous works apart from works he says blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and and again folks when you think of the word imputation it means to put to one's account, okay? Their works could not save them, okay? So they were saying, I believe God. I believe that there is a Jesus Christ. Jesus is mentioned all through the Old Testament. I mean, you look at Isaiah 53 and many, many others. And so they were pointing towards the Messiah. And, and, and these writers were, so they had to look at a coming Messiah, and Abraham and David did that. It says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Folks, I am telling you, the Bible tells us when we get saved, our sin is taken away. Matter of fact, if you need a verse there, Psalm 103 verse 12. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions, transgressions from us. Folks, I am telling you, when we get saved, God erases all of our sins. And it doesn't mean that we're perfect. It means we are forgiven. And folks, if I were you, I would thank God every day, every day, every day for the forgiveness of sin. God forgives us. God loves us. He hates sin. And He doesn't want us to sin. But that doesn't mean uh, that we're not Christians. That doesn't mean that we don't have a relationship with 
Jesus Christ. So you see these two examples of justification by faith. And then starting in verse 9, we see justification, not circumcision. See, Abraham was justified before, uh, before circumcision. Okay, we read Genesis chapter 12. We read Genesis uh, chapter uh, set, or 15. And circumcision didn't come into the Word of God until Genesis chapter 17. And we'll read that in just a minute. Look at verse 9. Does this blessedness then come from the circumcised only or the uncircumcised also? This is Paul asking them. For we say... Uh, that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. I mean, he just quoted that up earlier in verse 3. It was accounted unto him for righteousness. Verse 10, how then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. So he blows their theory out of the water. The, the man, Abraham, the father of faith, who they looked up to, who if you really think about it, folks, all nations, because it was after the flood, all nations come from him, all right? All nations, and even Christianity, all right? It started in this covenant relationship in chapter 12 when God chose them. Folks, I don't have time to get into this, but you know, folks, God chooses you. You were chosen, the Bible says, even before the foundations of the world. And that, is, that should make you feel really good because he chose you. Not while circumcised, look at, keep reading with me, but while uncircumcised, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while he was still uncircumcised, that he might be the father to all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And that's what he is explaining. He is explaining if the father of the Jews, the father of the Jews, if he was made righteous when he was uncircumcised, then folks, salvation is for everyone. We need to know that. We, they needed to know that. The circumcision really didn't have anything to do with that. Genesis chapter 17. Go back there. Let's look at this real quick. Genesis chapter 17, verse 9. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants, after you throughout all the generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised uh, in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between you and I. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generation. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your uh, descent. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And folks, we know circumcision was a sign. Okay, it was a sign. It was a seal. A seal. And that was the covenant that God made with the Jewish nation. And you know, about the best example I can think of today uh, uh, would be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a seal and, uh, excuse me, a notary stamp, okay? And a notary stamp these days, you have to get it notarized to be official, okay? If you're just looking for a modern day, okay, circumcision doesn't save you. It's what he's trying to say, all right? It is that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. Then the Bible says, if you go back with me, it says uh, in verse 12, and the father of circ circumcision to those uh, not only are the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Later in G Galatians, in Galatians 5, go with me if you would. Paul speaks of, of circumcision. 
Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And, and again, he is talking about the law, folks. We are free. We need to obey the law. We need to respect the laws. Okay, but the law doesn't save us, is what he is saying. We are free. We are free in Christ Jesus. Matter of fact, he said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Folks, that's, that's a simple explanation. Circumcision is an outward sign. What changes people is circumcision of the heart. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And there's nothing wrong with circumcision these days. But it has nothing to do with a male's salvation. That was the sign in those days. In verse 3, And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. And folks, they can't. It is impossible to keep the whole law. For instance, thou shalt not bear false witness. You've never lied. Well, you just lied. Okay? We all sometimes have exaggerated or we've lied uh, to, to save face or we lied just to maybe even not to hurt somebody's feelings. But we should not lie, okay? Verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. And again, he is not saying they were saved and they have fallen from grace. It's saying is they're going by the law and not by grace. Folks, we are saved by faith and grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness uh, by faith. And again, you know, the sign now in our modern day, in, in our day, okay, when we get saved, that sign is the Holy Spirit. God places the Holy Spirit inside of us when we get saved. Look at verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Faith through love. Folks, we need to remember that. It's not circumcision. It's justification by faith. And then the last thing I want you to see Back in our text in Romans chapter 4, look at verse 13. Justification by imputation. In imputation, I said earlier, is to put to one's account. Even in Abraham's life, to, to be counted as righteous before God. Not by our own righteousness, but by his righteousness. Look at verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir, heir to the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is made no effect. And folks, I'm telling you, the law cannot save you. It cannot save you is what Paul, and he, I know it seems repetitious about this, but that was their whole life. The Jewish leaders of those days wanted to look right, wanted to be seen, wanted to act like they were holy, wanted to act like they were righteous. And, and Jesus got all over them for that. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. And the reason for the law, and the reason the law was given to us, it's like a plumb line. It shows that we are sinners. It shows that before we met Christ, we broke the law. And we need salvation. And let me put it in plain language, folks. A person has to know they're lost before they can get saved. There are people that don't think they're lost. They have every excuse in the world of why they think they're saved. And Paul is just saying, especially to the Judaizers, you are missing the boat. It's not the law. It's not circumcision. 
It's a personal faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 16, therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to the grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. And what was that promise that I, he, he had to Abram? I will make you the father of many nations. The father, the father of many nations. But also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. The father of us all. Okay? Then it says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. And God who gives life to the dead, calls those things which do not exist as though they did. For instance, what a lot of people just say, they said, the reason I don't believe in God because I don't see God. You show me God and I'll believe. Well, folks, I'll show you God every day of your life. You wake up and breathe his air. You go out and you can see his beauty. You know that, you know, uh, he sustains. I mean, how can the earth be spinning? And how can all these things be in orbit? And everything is in order. When you look up, when you look up and see the stars, God is everywhere. But some people just won't believe. They don't believe. Look what it says. Who contrary to the hope, in the hope believed that he might become the father of many nations according to what he has spoken. The hope in hope. What is he talking about? I'm telling you, I have heard this answer many, many times. I ask them, if you were to, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And you know what they say? I hope so. Do you want that answer? You want to, to go in front of God with all of eternity in the balance saying, I hope so. Folks, I don't. I don't. And that's the difference between hope so and hope. Folks, our hope is in Jesus Christ our Lord. The only chance you have is in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what he is saying here. You can hope all you want, but we can know. 1 John 5, 13 says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. And it's not in the law. It's not, uh, you know, in circumcision. It's in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 19. And not being weak in faith, did he not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb? What was he saying? He is saying they believed in God. They believed that God could do anything. He was 99 years old when he had a son. She was 89 years old. That is physically impossible. But my Bible says, with God, all things are possible. He showed that kind of faith. He was using that as an example. And he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And folks, I've talked to people, and they just says, well, I can't believe you just, you just have to believe. You just have to believe. Matter of fact, the Bible says, folks, if you have the faith of a child, you can be saved. And that's what Abraham did. He believed God. He, he gave him that proof. Even though he was late in life, he promised an heir. And that happened. Late in life, when, when man would say, impossible. It's impossible. Folks, I'm telling you, my God can do anything. Verse 22, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Folks, that's what imputed means. Okay? Just like Abram, he was saved on his belief. And even before the cross, think about this. I don't have time to get into it, but folks, there was that holding place before the cross when Jesus, during that time in between, went and got all the Old Testament out of the holding place and made a parade straight up to heaven because his blood was shed. 
The veil of the temple was torn in two. We don't need animal sacrifices anymore. The blood of Jesus Christ saves us. Verse 23, Now it was not written for His sake alone that it was imputed to Him, but also for us. Folks, i got news for you today. I don't care who you are in this building. God can save you. God can save you. If He can give a baby to a 99-year-old and an 89-year-old, I think He can handle salvation. But here's the key. You can't come your way. You've got to come the way of the cross, folks. You've got to come believing this is the Word of God. You have to come knowing that you are a sinner. You have to come asking forgiveness of your sin. You have to come making Jesus Lord of your life and believing in Jesus that He lived a perfect life and He suffered on the cross for you and believing that after three days He arose again. Look at verse 24. And it shall be... Now, it was not written for His sake alone that it was imputed to Him, but for us also. It shall be imputed to us who believe Him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Folks, we are justified by faith and grace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians, Ephesians, let's go a couple of chapters over. Ephesians chapter 2. I know you know this. Ephesians chapter, I said, I said chapters, a couple of books over. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Folks, how plain can it be? How plain can it be? That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Folks, I'm telling you that is salvation. Faith and grace. In the last scripture, Hebrews, Hebrews, go with me to Hebrews, chapter 11. And folks, this is the key. Hebrews 11, the whole chapter gives people of the Word of God, the people uh, of the Word, faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and for the evidence of things not seen. Folks, God has never made an appearance to me. He has never made an appearance. Okay, you couldn't be standing in the, in the, you know, the presence of God the way we are now. You couldn't do it. But yet, I still believe. How do you believe? You believe in faith. You believe in God. And verse 6 is the key. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Folks, it's, it's faith and grace. You can't do it without that. For he who comes to God, look at this, must believe that He is. What is He? He's the creator of this world. What is He? He's the sustainer of this world. What is He? He's a God that loves you so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for you. And that is salvation. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And here's the beautiful part about the Word of God and about the service today. Nobody has to walk out of here not knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have heard the gospel today. Paul has shared the gospel That's what the whole book of Romans is about. And if you're here today, and if you are not sure, I mean sure that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven, the best decision you could possibly make today is accepting Jesus Christ as your your Lord and Savior by faith. Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for the book of Romans. I thank you that Paul, Lord, is just lays it out there, God. It's not obeying the law. It's not circumcision. 
It's simple trust in Jesus Christ. And God, I pray, if there's one here that doesn't know you today, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray that as soon as we stand and as soon as we start a singing, that they would just come forward and just simply say, I need to be saved today. God, it would be the greatest day of their life. God, you have the power. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You can forgive every sin that they have committed. You can forgive them, God, and thank you for the forgiveness of sin. So God, today could be the first day of the rest of somebody's life. So God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict hearts this day. Maybe others need to rededicate their life to Christ or come for baptism. Even join us uh, in, in wanting to be a part of this church body. God, just speak to us during this time of uh, invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.